All right. Welcome, everyone, to ICON. Uh, my name is Dan. I'm the lead pastor here and excited to be with you guys uh, this morning. Last week, we didn't have church because it was raining. Uh, so obviously, there was some flooding, so we missed you. Uh, glad you guys were able to stay safe and stay dry and Hopefully you can stay driving as uh, we don't run out of gas here. So uh, we're excited that you guys actually made it in, decided to uh, use some of your gas, ration it to make it here, and uh, we're excited to have you guys here with us. And uh, I'm also excited to be jumping into this series, uh, Frequently Asked Questions. Uh, this is a series that we've been talking about for several weeks, and we've actually gotten some of these questions, actually uh, most of these questions, pretty much everything we're going to be talking about came from you. Uh, we asked you to write in questions that you had, and we received several, several questions. And, and I just want to speak to some of the questions that we're not going to be able to answer in the series because we can't answer every question because we all like to go home. So uh, we're going to be taking one question a week and dealing with that. So to the people, there are some people that wrote in questions that were deeply personal. And I could tell from the, the way the question was asked, it was about a specific situation in their life. And, and I just want to let you know, if you wrote in a question, we don't have a chance to address it. Uh, you're welcome to call in or email into the church and to set up an appointment to talk with a pastor. Uh, some of the situations were so specific, we can't really deal with it here, but we would love to meet with you because uh, that's kind of what... That's kind of what pastors do, right? That's one of the things that's in our job portfolio. So we would love to meet with you and connect and be able to help talk through some of your questions. Uh, but when we started off, we realized we're going to get all kinds of questions. And, and we realized we, we deal with questions all the time, especially parents in the room. We deal with lots of questions, don't we? We deal with questions like if you ever drive someplace, you hear the question, are we there yet? Right, yeah. Or like, um, you know, when the kids are out playing and stuff, it's like, when is dinner? You know, again, are we there yet? You know, what's for dinner? There's like all kinds of these questions. Or every child's favorite question to ask is why, why? right? Yeah, we're all like in pain as we answer that. Like, uh, right? Like kids want to know why all the time. And you answer and they say, well, why? Why that? You answer, well, why? And they answer, why? I don't care, right? It just is, right? It kind of, and then you end up as a parent, you throw down the because I'm the parent line, right? Anybody like that one? Yeah, you just like, listen, I'm done discussing why. And, and those are questions that we deal with all the time in life. So I was kind of curious what kinds of questions would come in. And I gotta be honest, I was really hoping that week one, I'd kind of get a bit of a softball, right? Like a real easy question, you know, some, some question that they were asking. I, I, don't, I don't know what kind of question, but I was really hoping for some low-hanging fruit, um, and you wouldn't do that. So, um, so I'm not a big fan of you guys. No, you guys, the question that came in more than any other question is a question that people have been wrestling with for millennia. Like thousands of years, Bible scholars, theologians, people a lot smarter than me have wrestled with this huge question, and that was a question that was asked overwhelmingly more than any other question. And it came in different forms. I'm going to read a few of the kind of questions that came in, different ways that this has been asked. Um, if God is good, why does he put hurt and pain and struggles into your life? Why does God let a good person die and a bad person live? Why does God allow so much uh, famine, war, violence? Why it seems that evil flourishes in our world? Why is there so much pain and suffering? How is, injustice, how is it that injustice goes unpunished, uh, that good people don't, deserve, don't uh, receive what they deserve? This is known as the problem of pain or the problem of suffering, kind of in theological uh, questions and circles. Uh, this is a big, big question. And I think it's appropriate that the Sunday that we were going to deal with this question was a Sunday that this was actually happening to hundreds and thousands of people just a few hours from us. I mean, many of you friends and family, you're dealing with this very question, why? And it's so random sometimes. I was talking to someone after first service and they said, man, my house is good. We're honestly fine, but man, a few doors down, they've got water clear into their house. And sometimes we ask those questions, why? Why would this happen? Why am I walking through this? Why This problem of pain is a big big problem. In fact, the oldest book in the entire Bible deals with this question. The oldest book that we have is this account of the life of Job and suffering that he goes through, and it's dealing with this. And he has these friends that offer really stupid answers. Have you ever known Christians with really dumb answers to the problem of pain, right? Like if you've been in church very long at all, you've probably heard some of those. 
And and we don't want to do that. We want to answer as intellectually honest as we can and help people. My goal today isn't to answer every single question and solve every little problem. If people have been wrestling with this for thousands of years, I'm probably not going to get this thing summed up in the other 25 minutes I have today. Like, it's just probably not going to happen, right? So I, and I also want to say, we're going to fully enter the world of Dan's opinions, Because there's a lot of different opinions out there and there are a lot of different answers to this question. So all I can do is be honest with me and give you what has helped me in times like this. And that's what I'm gonna do. I don't propose to answer every theological problem. Trust me, I don't. I'm just going to give you what has helped me and I hope and I pray that it's helpful to you and to people that you know. So this is the question as we're gonna frame it today is why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen? happen to good people? And the first answer I want to go on record for my answer is, I don't know. Because I don't, right? Like I just, I wish I could just stop there, but I know it wouldn't be helpful, but I would feel most comfortable with this answer. I don't know. And, And leave it at that. But I realize that that's not helpful. That you're still sitting there going, well, there's still a problem. And the problem of pain is kind of framed uh, like this. We're talking about the problem of pain. And it's framed kind of like this. Because there's pain and suffering in the world, okay, we would all acknowledge, would we agree that there's pain and suffering in the world? Yeah? Okay. All you got to do is turn on the news. So yes, we would all agree with this. So you have some options. Option one, God does not exist. That's an option. We are here in church, and uh, so we're going to say that's not the option we're choosing. So then we got option two, God exists, but he's not good. Well, we wouldn't agree with that, right? So we're like, no, I don't think option two is right. And then you get option three, which is God exists and is good, but can't do anything he wants. And all of a sudden we start going, uh, there's a problem. Like I, well, God's all powerful, right? Like he, he can do anything he wants, right? Like, and this is the problem that we find ourselves in. This is the problem of pain. This is what theologians have wrestled with. And they said, if we're going to believe God exists and we know there's pain and suffering, then what do we do with this? Is he all good? Well, if he's all good, then is he not all powerful? If he's all powerful, then clearly he's not all good. And, and in this question, people have wrestled with for thousands and thousands of years. And a lot of times there's kind of a fourth option that people will throw out. And here's what kind of the fourth option looks like. God exists, is good, can do anything, but for reasons we cannot fully comprehend, chooses to allow suffering. And I think from a distance, like when we're outside of pain, just from an intellectual standpoint, this one we like the most, right? Because it like allows us to have all our categories. The problem with this answer is when you're actually going through pain, this isn't helpful, right? Like we're going, well, somehow it's good. You're like, no, trust me. There's no way this is good. Like it's not. And from a distance you, and here's the problem is because we like the theological categories that this gives us, but people outside the church and people within the church going through painful situations, this isn't helping them because what this leads to is this leads to kind of Christian cliches. And it leads to answers like this. Oh, it's all a part of God's plan somehow. To which you'd say, well, God has a messed up plan. Like, it's not helpful. Or, or, well, God wants to bring good from this. Or, or, you know, you think it's bad, but there's really something good going on. I know that genocide seems really bad. I get it. But there's something good under there. Like, you just have to wait and kind of see. Or, you know, how about this one? When someone dies, well, God needed her up in heaven. You kidding me? I don't care what God needs. Like, I didn't want to lose her. I didn't want to lose him. Like this, guys, we got to stop doing this. God is punishing you. Maybe this isn't directly communicated, but I've talked to so many Christians as they pray about a situation and you get this sense that like, well, yeah, that kind of happened because God's punishing you and he's mad at you. This disease is ravaging this certain community because of, you know, what they've done. This hurricane, I've listened to pastors say, well, this hurricane hit this part because of all the horrible things that that city was going through. You know how messed up theology that is? And it comes from this position of like, well, no, God's, he's all powerful, he's all good, and we just don't understand it. And it leads to answers like this. Or God wants to make you stronger. How's that one? That one makes you want to puke. You're like, hey, how about this? How about I go to the gym? That'll make me stronger. Like, God, I don't need your help in this department. I can handle this right? Or, or there's another one. God wants this pain to point you to him. 
See, because when I read the scriptures, what I read is that his goodness and his kindness lead us to repentance, not suffering and pain. And this, this is a problem that we have to deal with. We have to face this. We have to acknowledge this, that there is a problem with pain when this is the direction that we're going. When we say, hey, so what we want to do is I want to put the problem of pain back up here. Here it is. Because there's pain and suffering, here are our options. And we would look at this and we go, Dan, you're a pastor. There are no good options on this table. You can't answer. And here's what I'd like to say. And I know this may be unpopular, but just stay with me for a while. I believe that God exists and is good, but can't do anything he wants. Let's let the heresy settle for a little bit, right? Like, I know what you're thinking. Like, uh, should we get our pitchforks now? Like, at what point do we drag Dan off the stage? I get it. But I want you to follow me for a second. I want you just to listen. Have you ever been posed with the question, can God make a rock so big he can't lift? Anybody ever heard that before? And, and, and when someone asks you this, you go, well, God can do it, so of course he can. Not. Nah, wait, hold on. Uh, if he can, then he can't lift it. But if he can't lift it, then he can't make it. And you kind of get stuck in this problem. Or someone asks you, like, well, if God can, can do anything, can he create a being more powerful than himself? Like, well, that would make him not God, you know? And you kind of feel stuck. And, and here's the thing. First and foremost, we're probably understanding God's power completely differently. And we're looking at it in ways that we can never comprehend God. And to, to, to believe that a finite mind could understand the infinite is just ridiculous in the first place. So we're probably starting from a not great point, right? But I, but I think the answer to that is, God, no. God can't make a rock so big he can't lift. God cannot make things that are illogical possible. Can God make one plus one three? No. Like, like he can't, that's just not how it works. God is limited by those things. And you might go, well, I don't know if that's theological. Okay, how about this? How about it is impossible for God to lie? That's, I don't know, in the Bible, right? So there is something that God cannot do. God cannot act contrary to his character. He can't. That's something that God can't do. Or this is another scripture. It's impossible for God to lie. For I, the Lord, do not change. God can't lie. God can't change. He's immutable. God doesn't change. He can't. So we have to acknowledge there are certain things that God can't do. And again, I get it that that kind of rubs us the wrong way and that like creates categories and problems. But what I want to do today, again, I want to say this is Dan's opinion, but this has helped me when I've gone through painful situations and circumstances. And what we want to do is we want to help people move forward in the midst of this pain, in the midst of this suffering. And what I've seen when we say, oh, you just don't understand it, but God's doing something good here, that that's unhelpful and that pushes people away from God. So what I want to do is help draw people closer to him. And, and, and let me just say this. Here's, here's what I, I fully understand. You might be sitting there and you might go, yeah, yeah, you say that God, you know, can't do certain things. Like if I were to climb up to this, you know, roof and I were to jump off the roof, I would head towards the ground at a very fixed speed, right? God can't just like, well, gravity's not going to work now. I'd move to the ground at eight, 9.8 .8 meters per second squared, and then I would hit the ground, Right? Like, that just would happen. God can't stop that. Now, you might sit there and you might go, well, wait a minute, Dan, what about miracles, right? And here's the thing. I acknowledge I believe in miracles. I've seen what I believe to be a miracle in one of my own children's life. So I, I get it. But can we acknowledge something? Just like miracles in and of themselves have their own problems, right? Because why does God heal someone in this situation and not in this situation? right? Was their faith not enough? No, of course not. Well, did God just not want to help them? No, no, listen, uh, so I get it. I, I'm going to sit here firsthand and say, I believe in miracles, but also to the skeptic in this room, I, I hear you. I know what you're thinking. Miracles create their own problems. Why is it that it seems like God might do miracles in this situation, but not heal this sort of situation? I get it. I know. What I want to do today is focus on things that are going to help us move forward. I was reading a book recently. It's called When Bad Things Happen to Good People, because it's not like if bad things happen to good people. How many of you know? It's when, not if. And there was something that I read in here that was really helpful. And again, I'm not, I don't endorse everything in there, but it was very helpful to me. And, and he said this, I said, laws of nature do not make exceptions for nice people. A bullet has no conscience. Neither does a malignant tumor or an automobile gone out of control. 
That is why good people get sick and get hurt as much as anyone. If we were to run the statistics of who bad things happen to, and we were to categorize people however you want to categorize them, good, bad, they've done more good than they've done bad, Christian, not Christian, whatever religion, you know what it's going to be? It's going to be about even across the board. Because bad things just happen. They just do. It happen to every single one of us. Some of us are sitting in this room right now, and you are walking through it. You are walking through pain, and you're walking through suffering, and you're asking the question, why? And unfortunately, sometimes what the church responds with is answers that aren't very helpful. Have you ever been told this? Oh, listen, I know it seems hard, but God's not going to give you more than you can handle. As if to say, it's not that big of a deal. First of all, when people say the Bible says God's not going to give you more than you can handle, that's not true. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that you won't be tempted beyond what you can bear, but it does not say that you will not be given more than you can bear. Because I've met people, and you've met people, that have been given more than they can bear, and it's crushed them. And it's, they haven't known how to get through it, and sometimes they haven't. I read this. I want to read this to you. It's a, it's a little long, but I just want you to bear with me. It says, Does God temper the wind to the shorn lamb? Does he never ask more of us than we can endure? My experience, alas, has been otherwise. I've seen people crack under the strain of unbearable tragedy. I've seen marriages break up after the death of a child because parents blamed each other for not taking proper care or carrying the defective gene or simply because the memories they shared were unendurably painful. I've seen some people made noble and sensitive through suffering, but I've seen many more people grow cynical and bitter. I've seen people become jealous of those around them, unable to take part in the, bur- the routines of normal living. I've seen, ca- uh, I've seen cancers and automobile accidents take the life of one member of a family and functionally end the lives of the five others who could never again be the normal, cheerful people they were before disaster struck. If God is testing us, he must know by now that many of us fail the test. If he is only giving us burdens we can bear, I have seen him miscalculate far too often. I get it. Sometimes life deals a blow that's unbearable. And for us to go, oh, you just don't get it. There's good that's going to come out of it. Doesn't help. It pushes people away. Today, I want to acknowledge that stuff happens in life and it's bad and it's hard and I get it. And far too often, church is a place of all places that we should be able to come with our problems. Church becomes a place that you got to put on a mask. And you got to act like you got it together. And you walk in, you shake someone's hand, they say, how are you doing? And you got to say, oh, I'm doing good, brother. I'm too blessed to be stressed. God is good all the time. All the time. Right? There's people sitting there saying it because they're supposed to, but they don't believe it. Saying, well, he's not to me right now going through it. And church is a place that's too often people feel like they can't be real. They can't be real with themselves. They can't be real with God. And they sure can't be real with the people in the room. And let me just say in this room, at this church, it's okay to not be okay. It is. If you're not okay in this room, it's okay. It's just not okay to stay that way. And we want to help you. We want to come alongside you. And I remember when I was going through something incredibly difficult, when I thought one of my children, I genuinely thought one of my children were going to die. I remember being in the hospital, rolling my daughter away for a a, a procedure, and I I, I remember thinking, I'm not going to see her come back. I vividly remember that. And I remember going to the Ronald McDonald house and trying to pray and trying to figure something out to reconcile what I believed about God and my experience with life. I remember that so vividly. I remember reading some things that different people wrote in the scriptures, stories, accounts of their lives that helped me so much. And at first you might go, how would this help you? But listen, this, the solidarity I felt when I read this helped me so much. One of Israel's greatest kings, a guy that people said this was a man after God's own heart. Here's what he said. He said, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? 
How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? And it's easy to look at this and go, whoa, David, chill. Like, that's God. The thing is, this isn't the only place. Throughout the Psalms, David is just crying out. He's angry. He's ticked off. He's letting God have it. There is an entire passage, there's an entire book in our Bible called Lamentations, where there's this prophet by the name of Jeremiah that's just lamenting. He's weeping. He's crying out. He's making accusations. He's saying, there was another king of Israel, one of the wisest people that have ever lived, and then he looked at everything. And in the book that's accredited to him, he says, it's all meaningless. Like everything is worthless, has no meaning. There is no purpose or meaning to life. Just has seen everything and is at the lowest of lows. Now listen, let me just say this. Just because it's in the Bible, like doesn't mean that's like, like when you read like, did God really forget David? No. So it's not like all of those things are inherently true, but what's true about it is this is how they really felt. And that's why I love that we have this in the scriptures is that we, what we don't have is a bunch, we don't have David being persecuted and chased down and scared of his life going, well, God's good all the time, all the time, God is good. No, David's like flipping out. I love that. I found so much solidarity there. So what I wanna do is I wanna, I wanna help us. And again, if you're walking through this, today is for you. And if you're not walking through this right now, this is likely either for someone else in your life or pack it away for someday. Because life's gonna happen. It will. And we have to acknowledge that there are hundreds and thousands of people just hours from us that are dealing with this right now. So I wanna acknowledge some truths that might be helpful in this situation. Number one, God is not on the side of those who cause suffering, but those who suffer. Now listen, I'm not saying that God is against certain people, but what I'm saying is that many times we're led to believe if you're suffering, it's because you're doing something wrong. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. If there, if there is any meta narrative, if there's a theme that stretches across the whole arc of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, if there's one truth that you could pull out, it would be something along the lines of God hears the cries of the oppressed and he draws near to them. Like that if there's anything, you can see that in Exodus, you can see that on all over, you can see that with prophets and kings and judges and Jesus, like God hears the cry of the oppressed and he draws near to those who suffer. So listen, if there's a truth we wanna start with, it's if you're suffering, God's with you. And it's not that God is doing this to you, he's not punishing you, it's not that you don't have enough faith, it's not that you're doing something wrong, God draws near to those who suffer. The second truth is it's unkind to offer pat religious answers to people who are in the throes of suffering. It's not helpful. Have you ever been going through something? Maybe it's not something that's dramatic, but you've had a really bad day. You're really upset. You're really frustrated. You sit down to next somebody, sometimes your husband, and you, you say it all and they want to fix it, right? Because husbands, what do we like to do? We like to fix things, right? And we listen and we're like, oh, well, here's what you need to do. Just do this and this. And then they're mad at you. And you're like, why are you mad at me? Like, I'm, I fixed it for you, right? And they don't want it to be fixed, do they? They want you to feel it. Have you ever talked to somebody and they just try to fix stuff for you? And you're trying to say why you're upset, why you're frustrated, and they're just giving you all these Christian cliches and you're going, not helpful. Like, that's not doing anything for me. On the other side of it, have you ever been going through something difficult? You sit down next to someone and they, they clearly don't know what to say and they're awkward they're kind of like, oh, uh, and then they just sit there. Maybe they put their arm around you. They don't say anything. And that's the greatest thing they ever could have said is nothing. Sometimes the most healing words that can ever be spoken are me too. Like, I get it. I'm so sorry. I've been there. That sucks. Like sometimes that's the most healing thing that we can hear. So offering up cliches uh, many times is just so unhelpful. It's, it's not doing anyone any good. So we have to acknowledge that. And the third truth I'd like to leave you with is the most important question is not why did God let this happen to me, but rather how can God help me endure now that this has happened? We will go to our graves asking why. Why did this happen? Why did that happen? 
And I'll go back to my first answer. I don't know. Because it's the world we live in. We live in a world where sometimes there's weather patterns that create hurricanes that you think is going to miss you. And then it comes right at you. And it ends up being worse than you ever could have imagined. Because it does. So when you're going through pain, listening, wasting time on why did God let this happen? It's the wrong kind of question. The question we need to ask is, God, how can you help me endure this now that it has? How can I make it through this? And I remember, I remember so vividly being in such a difficult place, wrestling and being so angry at God and being frustrated and not understanding, feeling like, God, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm, heck, I'm a pastor. Like, why? Like, come on, is there, haven't I done enough? I remember being so frustrated. And then when I was reading David, I was reading some of the things he was saying and I was finding some solace in that and I was like, oh, yes. I read something that kind of messed with me a little bit. I, I, I didn't understand it. He says this. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning, oh my God, in the cry, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and I am not silent, but you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. I remember reading that. I was like, okay, like, yeah, like, why have you forsaken me? Why aren't you helping me? Why, you, you don't even listen to my groaning. It's just day and it's night, but you are holy. I remember reading that thinking, what? Like, that's the last thing, David, you should be saying right now. And thrown in the praises of Israel? I'm not praising right now. There are other places that David would just, he's just having it out with God. He's having it out. And he talks about singing. I mean, here's another one of his passages. Here's what he says. He says, but I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt, dealt bountifully with me. And I'm going, David, no, he hasn't. He hasn't dealt bountifully with you. And he hasn't dealt bountifully with me. And, and listen, I'm not trusting in your mercy because I don't, I don't feel mercy right now. And if you're in that place, if you've been in that place, if you know someone in that place, it's okay to feel that way. But here's what David is doing. He's going, God, I don't understand. In one moment, he's just putting it out there. He's saying, but at the end of the day, I'm gonna to choose to trust you. Not because I feel like it, because I choose it. As this brutal choice of my will, I declare you're holy, you're merciful, you're dealing bountifully with me. In the midst of my pain, I'm gonna to choose to sing. And I remember being in that room reading that going, God, I don't even know if I can do that. I don't know if I have it in me but to do it. God, I, I can't. I just countless times I'd read this. Solomon, another guy, when he's saying it's meaningless, it's worthless, at the very end of it all, he goes, but it's our job to just fear God and obey him. It's like, I, I don't get it. I don't, it doesn't make sense. I'm angry, but I'm going to choose this. And sometimes what we tell people in the church is like, when you come in, oh, leave your burdens at the door. Leave your problems at the door and come in and worship Jesus. And that's wrong. You know what David tells me? David says, I can bring my junk right here. All my issues, all my problems, all my concerns, all my pain, all my suffering, I can bring it right with me. I don't have to leave anything at the door. I can come right to this place worship him in the midst of it. And you know what? The best you may have is just standing there. I can't sing a thing. I don't know what to say. But I'll stand here. Or you eke out a few words of, of worship. That's the best you've got. That's okay. You see, when you're going through moments like that, the best way to make it when you're walking through hell is to just keep walking. Like, how do I make it? It feels like I'm walking through hell on earth. Well, don't stop. You just keep walking. 
with a brutal choice of your will, put one foot in front of the other. And here's the thing. We have hundreds and thousands of people that are walking through this right now. And it's easy to say, oh, let's, let's sit here and let's pray prayers. And that's good. And we will do that. Man, I was so encouraged. I thought it was awesome that our president has declared today a national day of prayer for Houston and the surrounding areas. And we will join with him and we will join with Christians around this nation to pray for that com- those communities. Absolutely. I will, I will continue, even when I don't understand miracles and God and any of that, we will continue to pray for that. But we can't stop there. We can't let that be it. We've got to add our actions to our prayers. Now, as I was going through this book, I came across a poem that I thought, man, I, I want to end with this. Because it's so true. It says this. We cannot merely pray to you, O God, to end war. For we know that you have made the world in a way that men must find his own path to peace within himself and with his neighbor. We cannot merely pray to you, O God, to end starvation. For you have already given us the resources with which to feed the entire world if we would only use them wisely. We cannot merely pray to you, O God, to root out our prejudice. For you've already given us eyes with which to see the good in all men, if we would only use them rightly. We cannot merely pray to you, O God, to end despair. For you have already given us the power to clear away slums and to give hope, if only we would use our power justly. We cannot merely pray to you, O God, to end disease. For you have already given us great minds with which to search out cures and healing, if we would only use them constructively. Therefore... We pray to you instead, O oh God, for strength, determination, and willpower to do instead of just pray, to become instead of merely wish. See, church, when we pray, God, I help those people. I think sometimes how God responds is, I will, would you go? Would you help them? God, give them the resources that they need. I, I know they need clothing and they need, there's diapers and God goes, okay. Why don't you go buy some and deliver them? God, would you send volunteers? Would you send people down there to help them clean up and make it through this? Yes. Will you go? You see, we need to become the answers to our prayers. We can't pray for somebody else to do it and not be willing to do it ourselves. And we've asked that of ourselves as a church and said, what can we do specifically for the people of Houston? And we looked around at what already was happening and there were people in churches that were taking up donations and doing different things and taking supplies and clothing and things that are needed for the people down there in the different centers and the different places where they are. And, they said, and we said, you know what? Other people are doing that. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We don't need to say, hey, we want to collect diapers so we can put icon on it and send it like, Who cares? I want them to have diapers. So if you're in this room and you want to help in that way, go online. And there's chambers of commerce. There are other churches. There are businesses. There are school districts that are collecting all kinds of things that you can send those things. Do that. Actually do it and not just pray. We decided what can we do as a church And we have a specific relationship with a national uh, disaster relief agency that's recognized by the government. They're meeting with the city and the state in Austin days before this hurricane blew in, preparing to get boots on the ground. They're there right now. They're focusing on Beaumont and Rockport. So that's where they're setting up base. And they're taking volunteers right now. And we have a relationship with them. And we said, hey, we want to, that's what we want to do. We want to open up an opportunity for people to volunteer. So if you're in this room and you want to volunteer, you can do that. We're going to update our website and our blog, and you'll see it on social. There's a phone number to call. Here's the thing. They provide food for you. They provide all the equipment, everything you need. They just need warm bodies. And you need to go with one other person. So we're taking groups of up to, uh, at least two people. It can be larger groups. But you call this number, you sign up, and you go down. They're also working on setting up housing. So hopefully within a week from now, on the 11th, they're hoping to have housing set up, that if you want to take two, three, four days, if you want to take a week there, they can do that. And they'll provide all your food, all your lodging, all you, all you need to do is get there and have transportation while you're there. And we said, because of this key relationship we have with we, that we have, we want to open that up to all of you. So we'll be doing that today. 
We're going to join with people. We're going to pray here in a moment. In fact, we structured this morning so we'd have a couple, it's time for a couple of songs at the end of service. Because I realize this isn't just about Houston. It's about many of you. Many of you in this room are going through pain and suffering right now. And it's not a distant problem. It's one that's right in your face. So we want to pray with you. We want to help you through this. And I don't know why it happened. But I'm going to pray that you're able to walk through this. This can be a safe place to not be okay. We're going to have a prayer team on, on either side of the stage here if you want someone to pray with you. Or maybe you come from a background, you're like, I just, I need, I feel like I need to come down to an altar to pray. I, I, I need that. We want to open this up to you. There's nothing special or sacred about this space, but I understand sometimes for me, I need to come down to a place like this, a place that seems sacred in my head that I can pray and really focus and not be distracted. If you want to stay in your seats, you're welcome to. If you want to come down and pray with someone or come down here to the altar, you're welcome to do that. And for the rest of you in this room, maybe the best thing that you could do is if you see someone's praying, you could pray for them. You could put your hand on their shoulder just to say, hey, listen, I'm here. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to pray, but I'm here for you. And I will be. May this be a place of prayer. And can I ask, the band is going to dismiss after the couple of songs. You'll be able to get out of here on time and get lunch. But can we make this a place of prayer? Maybe you're just processing, thinking about this, thinking, is Dan a heretic? I don't know. Maybe like, maybe you're still processing this and that's okay. But can we just keep this a, a place of prayer? Be respectful for the people who are processing this. And let's choose to yes, pray. Yes, we're going to join with everyone else as we pray, but then to put feet to our prayers and to do something, to action on what we pray. Amen? Let's pray. God, I thank you so much.